Non, c'est du thé. <rire> OK. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome into this leadership lounge. I'm uh, Laurence from YM Lyon in France, and I'm very happy to be uh, hosting this uh, lounge with uh, Noémie Ponce uh, that you can see now on the screen. Hi, Noémie. Hello, everybody. Hello, Laurence. <laughs> so she's, a, she's an amazing artist. She's a very good friend of mine, and she lives in the south of France. And uh, many things happened to you the last month, Noemi, with the Anatoly in the city, I think. So I don't know if you, you want to give us a, a little update. Yeah, it's, um, it's a city. I'm actually, I just moved in a village. So I'm getting used to the country life after five years in Paris. But um, I opened a studio two months ago and uh, just create a new series on uh, the Blue Mountains because I am at the door just next to the Cévennes um, and this region in France is well known for the Huguenots and all the story of the Protestant and the prophets so I did a series um, to pay tribute to those people so um, it's getting very well I'm getting um used to like um the climate <laughs> coming yeah. from canada you know yeah. i never suffered from like too too much hot too, too much warmth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um i'm not gonna complain not gonna complain <laughs> but uh, yeah it's going very well in my new village Vizinor. Oh, that's yeah. great that's great we yeah. can see uh, your work on instagram i think you have an account in instagram right yeah no uh, n o dot pons p o n s yeah, you can okay. see all the new engravings. Okay, so I encourage everybody to have a look. Um, and we also have a, a website uh, going with uh, this leadership uh, community. And I would like to encourage you as leaders and staff to, uh, to go and visit the, the, the website because there's many resources, lots of talks, articles, uh, great stuff, you know, to, to go and check. And um, there's a... a a talk from last month about the work that uh, Noemi did also. Uh, but today we're going to talk about dynamic communication and uh, we are pleased to welcome Joseph Avakian and I'm going to let Noemi introduce him a little bit. Yes, hello Joseph. Uh, it's uh, uh, well if you're a creative and artist like me, but also if you work in communication or you're a leader in YWAM, you all know Joseph already. But uh, it's my honor to present him. He's like um, for the creative, he's our cheerleaders, he's our mentor, he's our inspiration. Um, like um, I um, I know Joseph for maybe 15 years now, and he always uh, encouraged me in my work. Um, he's a uh, Armenian Lebanese. Uh, he was born in uh, Liban, Liban, yeah, Liban in English, <laughs> Liban. Uh, but he grew up in Cyprus, and uh, but he traveled all around the world. He lived in many countries, and now he uh, he's established with his wife Monica in Germany. So um, Joseph is in YWAM for like um, since 1984. And um, and he, he pioneered many projects. He teach in DTSs, but second level school as well. And um, his main topic is identity, uh, destiny, calling, as well as uh, co-creating with God and uh, effective communication. So uh, that's why we invited him for this uh, topic of dynamic communication. But it's um it's it's impossible to present Joseph. Uh, without telling that um, it's in 1998 in YWAM Lausanne uh, that he uh, he received from God like the new logo for YWAM, the logo that we all know. So uh, it was made like 20, almost 25 years ago. So um, yeah, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Joseph. Welcome. Thank you. And um, to start the conversation, can you just like, um, I just give a, a, a short introduction, but could you like give, tell us more about your history, like uh, with YWAM and um, how uh, maybe like how this topic um, developed through the years within YWAM? Mm -hmm. Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome if you're watching live and welcome if you're watching later. Um, I, start, I met YWAM in 1979 in Cyprus where I was living at the time and I was uh, very attracted to the dynamic community in YWAM at the time. 
I also had gotten a calling very early uh, when I became a Christian. I felt at a missions rally in Cyprus that God was calling me to serve in communication and missions, specifically in graphic design. And he said, I want you to be missionary and I want you to do graphic design. So very early, I knew that my involvement with YM would have to include graphic design. Nevertheless, I did my DTS in 1982, also in Cyprus, with an outreach in Jordan, and uh, went back home after that. Actually, I was at home for two years uh, until the door opened for me to move to Germany to do the very first graphic design school that was led uh, by Albrecht Fietz at the time down in the castle Hurlach in the south of Germany. So I came there to do the school and my plan was to leave again because I always had a calling, I thought, for the Middle East, uh, but then went home afterwards. And uh, But before I left, they asked me if I want to come and join on staff. And so in 1985, I came and joined uh, the graphic design studio. So the very first ministry I was able to join in YWAM was a graphic design studio uh, that was publishing a magazine. We were doing uh, album covers, song books, uh, brochures, posters for many uh, YWAM events, as well as for uh, churches and Christian organizations. Then from there, I was there for about three years. Then we moved to Berlin, where my wife and I also continued working on this magazine that YWAM used to publish called Der Auftrag. So I did magazine design for many years. And during that time, also doing some freelance work on the side. And then from there, we left and moved down to the south of Germany and started a ministry called Media Plus, later became Art Lab Europe and led that where we did professional visual communication services uh, for YWAM, of course, and churches and organizations, but also for businesses, which was uh, quite an experience to have learned and gained and how to use your gift in serving people, but through the serving, be able to disciple people also in, for example, godly communication or integrity in communication and so on. And then from there, God led us to move to Hawaii for almost uh, seven years, uh, over seven years. We were there and I did a lot of training there. I focused more on training, not as much on production. And uh, then when that time closed, we moved back to Europe with a year in, or almost like three quarters of a year in Norway, and then nomading Europe for a while until we ended up here in Berlin the last five years where my wife and I work uh, still in communications. We both do graphic design as well as we run a, we're part of a ministry called the Bible Effect. If you don't know about it, uh, you can check out the website, thebibleeffect.com. And what we do is we create animated videos that teach you the historical background of each of the Bible books. So Monica has taught herself, not only she's already been an illustrator, but now she taught herself also animation. And so I help with creative directing, I do some uh, storyboarding, and then a lot of the social media and the branding for the ministry. And it's with a team of people that are also in Canada. So we're an international ministry that's bilocational, if you want to call it. And that's what we focus on right now. And of course, I could go around and travel and teach and also still do uh, branding for different organizations. So that's a big history, sorry. Thank you, yeah. And, and before we actually jump into the subject, like um, just so we can know a little bit more about you, like um, we know that you're a passionate, like extrovert person when you teach. Um, and um, could you tell us like, what is your main passion? Or like um, when you get up, like what, 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 what makes you actually get up in the morning? Wow, that's a good question. Um, I guess a couple of things. I mean, the first one is that you never know what a day has in store for you. I live from a very, from a very deep understanding that every day is an opportunity to have new revelation. Uh, so that's one. So what can we encounter on that day that will teach us more about who God is? Because I feel like God is everywhere. Um, God is actually communicating. The question is, are we listening? So to have the opportunity every day to hear from God or capture some revelation of who God is, who mankind is, who we are, and then bring that into the context of communication is always something I think I will never stop doing until the last breath I have. So I would say, you know, that, that revelation is one of those things that actually get me going. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, you, told, you told us a little bit about your history in YWAM, but um, so you, you, you grew up in Cyprus and I just learned that your grandmother was from 
Turkey and you speak seven different languages. So um, I guess it's like uh, you you don't only talk about dynamic communication, but you actually incarnate you are dynamic communication. So can you tell us a little bit more about your personal like journey? Well, that was that's that I always tell people I did not choose to learn these languages. I had to learn the languages. How well you learn them, that's a choice you have, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So when I came, for example, when I went to Cyprus and went to an English school, I had to study in English. But that also meant for me, once I joined YWAM, I felt I needed to master English to be able to function mm -hmm. internationally, at least in YWAM, especially because a lot of the, our centers are Anglo speaking. Um, so they're Anglophone and generally at least English is kind of around plus usually the regional or local language. Uh, but I think when I came to Germany, I was in my early twenties and I decided if I'm going to live here, I'm going to make, make this place a place of ministry. Then I said, okay, Holy Spirit, you speak German fluently. You live in me, <laughs> help me learn it well. And so uh, within a few years, when I got my German citizenship, uh, the guy was pretty impressed with my German. And I always say it's not because I'm smart, but because we have a genius who lives in us. So uh, I think God is a great communicator. And if we do walk in intimacy with him and in fellowship with him, then let's rub shoulders enough so that we can learn how to be excellent at articulation and communication so we can serve the people that God you know, called us to. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's really interesting to to hear about your story and uh, and um, it makes me think about Paul you know in the Bible uh, that uh, knew how to speak to people you know like he knew different languages but he was also like um, it was not just a question of language and words but it was also like a question of understanding the culture and and to know who's in front of you and not just talking but really like communicating and. Um, I looked in your website because uh, I don't knew I don't know you uh, that well, and uh, I I saw this quote that I really like, um, and it says, "Many can talk and many listen, but few only truly communicate." And um, yeah, I was wondering if you could develop this a little bit for us and maybe share with us the ABC of communication for today. Okay. <laughs> we have how much? A uh, few minutes, huh? Uh, <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, well, I do believe that we live in the information age, so many are talking, and we're not just talk. We're not using the word talk in context of having a dialogue, but the fact that we project information, we publish information, we're online, we're on social media, and that all of us are trying to communicate. And I guess communication has become so existential for us as human beings because God created us in his image, and I think he's a God who communicates. So we need to communicate to almost prove to ourselves that we exist. Now, that's important because we need to communicate. I think communication, we've seen also children need that. They need the interaction. At the same time, we are beings, God created to listen. And so we do hear, but I think we're very selective in our listening and our hearing. And I believe very often that we have become individuals who literally filter out what we don't want to hear and hear what we want to hear. And so often in communication and having, you know, being married for 36 years, an amazing <laughs> listener, I realized I was able to talk, but I wasn't very good at listening. And she taught me, Monica taught me a lot about listening. And, uh, and really being able to not just hear the words that are being said, but to understand the context and pick up on, the, on why this person is sharing this information and what is then, how can I counter that information, sometimes in just listening and not responding, not trying to fix the problem, other times in actually just agreeing and affirming the communication that's being communicated. And finally, at times, actually saying, well, you know, what would you, what would you like to do with this information? Should I help you? Is there a thing I can help you with? So there are different ways you can connect with people, but because we are busy with the world and because now we have a galore of, how should I say, information channels, the personal, the social media, the text messaging, the emailing, the voice messages, we are beginning to communicate and even when I know in my teachings, when I take the time to try to explain something, 
really intensely and clearly and very gradually. I still get students coming back and going, I really like what you said here. So you're saying this and this and this. And I'm like, uh, no, you weren't listening. Uh, because <laughs> what they're doing is pulling out what they identify with the most and mm -hmm. thus believing that what you just said is a little stamp of approval for how they think. So we have to learn to sometimes put down our filters so that we can listen and also to practice listening mm -hmm. as well as practice communication. And I believe just like in beauty or in art or it comes to any creativity, it should bring value to both parties that are communicating. So the value of interacting like we are is that it's I'm supposed to, in one sense, in this interview, be re-inspired for me, even as a, as a person who loves communicating for God and with God, as much as for those who are listening to go, wow, this is really good. I'm, I've never thought about it this way or that way. So it needs to bring value for everyone, including honor God, I think, in it. So uh, I would say the ABC is just really be intentional, be loving, be caring, and, and give time. Uh, one of my favorite statements to make often when I teach on uh, communication is that we all speak English, but it doesn't mean that we all understand each other. Mm. So true, so true. Thank you so much. And so you shared uh, already some uh, some challenges like uh, like having filters, being busy with uh, and having lots of information channels. Uh, what what are the main challenges for communication today? Do you have other examples like that? Well. I think there are a lot of examples. Uh, I remember back when we lived in Kona, uh, I did a survey for the staff. I said, what's your favorite means of communication? And it was interesting. You would think that in the age of you know text message and very quick media, everybody would be like high on uh, text message or calling or voice messages. The highest was actually email, which was quite surprising at the time. I don't know, maybe it was the audience, uh, the, the, the people that we had there. But I think every form of communication has a great um, DNA about it. So for example, when you need to write an email, you actually have to sit down and write down sentences that make meaning. So writing is a skill that I think everybody should learn. I'm having, I'm challenged with it right now because I'm trying to begin to put some thoughts down to maybe eventually write a few books. And so having to say something outside of yourself and taking a context of a message and communicate is something we've lost the art of because we've become very short message. So a tweet or a text message or even a picture. So we've become visual. We've become uh, what I call spotted communicators. So we take a spot and we just communicate one thing, but we're not taking time to actually sit down and say, how do I best articulate and communicate this? So it has longevity, it has value, and it is something that will, you know, outlive uh, at least the, the times a little bit. Not that I'm saying every statement you make or every letter you write or every message you, you create has to be something that is going to be quoted one day. But we need to come back to the art of, of writing just so that we can. And writing forces you to actually think, how do I begin? How do I lead the person? And how do I finish and conclude and hope that by the person reading it, they have made sense. So when I sit down to prepare a teaching, I do the same thing. I go, what would I want to start with? What should I, what should I focus on? And what, uh, what, how do I conclude? And what do they walk away with? What are the challenges that I need to give or resources and so on? So I think in the quickness of our age today, we have become very communicative, but poorer at it. If that makes sense. Yeah, I really like what you say. Like, I feel that we are always in a kind of a rush, you know, and uh, we need to communicate communicate fast, and uh, and and it it loses um, it loses this taste, you know, the the or deeper meanings, uh, as I can understand what you're saying. And uh, uh, so you encourage us to to take time to be intentional and to go deeper into what we're sharing. That's right. Yeah. And, that, and that each individual that we communicate with has a different language of uh, communication, as I say, or a different culture. Uh, mm -hmm. If we talk about cultivating communication cultures in our mission, I realize that because we're multicultural, that already is challenging. 
beyond that, just because someone comes from France doesn't mean they all communicate the same. Uh, so in the same way, we have to become a lot more customized and, in, and individualized in our approach to our team members, to those inside our, our communities, outside our communities, and at large. That's why when, I, when we talk about, for example, making a website for an organization or even, you know, use of the mission, I'm challenged often to say this is a public document. It has to be understood by a broad audience. So let's write it in a way that's not for us. You see, because sometimes when we write, we think, oh, this is how I would say it. No, no the, the good communicator would say, how would I say it in a way that the other would understand it? And hopefully someone that's very different than me, because if you can get there, then I think you can do the rest. Mm. So um, I hear what you're saying, Joseph, but when we work in an organization like YWAM <laughs> that is like multicultural and I'm doing a website for like more than 20 different nations, like what, what could you give us some tips or how can I communicate that in a way that would like uh, 20 different nations or culture can, can relate to? Um, well, one of the tips is to have a content strategy, like one of the key things to say, what, what should I put on there? That's not of value to me because sometimes we, we project our, our idea of what should be put there. Like, let's say we do schools, right? So we think we should put all the schools there. Uh, do I have to put all the schools or do I have to put the few schools that are a good beginning and then create space for more schools to be added later? so that people recognize, oh, so there's a series, and also to learn from how is one school communicated before I communicate 12 of them. Uh, also in the, in the articulation of words and choice of words, because we create a lingo within our own community mm -hmm. that is very colloquial. I call it, the word colloquial means it's like very local. And within use of the mission, we have our own YWAMIs as everybody knows. And so then often we write that way as if we're communicating to other YWAMers. Now, how I know this? Well, I invite <laughs> my YWAM friends to my party, to my birthday party, and I invite my non YWAM friends to the party. And eventually there's a little group happening and all the YWAMers sit together because they understand each other. Because every second sentence is the Lord spoke to me, um, you know, uh, when I did my DTS and, you know, God's character and nature. And then my other non YWAM friends are like, what is DTS and what is YWAM and what is, because instead of using the word YWAM, we say use of the mission. You know, when we talk about the great commission, that is what Jesus commanded his people in general, not just us as if it's exclusive to us and not anyone else and things like that. So there is the power of language that we can harness if we understand where the other person is standing. And I think we don't stand on the other side we tend to try to start with ourselves as if we're communicating to ourselves when we should start with our audiences and try to communicate to our audiences as if we were them, if that makes sense. <laughs> so you, you would say one of the mistakes we would do like as YWAM is kind of like use our own like uh, YWAM vocabulary when we're trying right. to reach. That's one. Um, yeah. And, uh, How can we improve? Like, what are the like mistakes that we're we're doing? Like in why I'm like if if we're trying to reach everybody and that people understand who we are. We're very we're very light on our history often as well. I don't think we talk a lot about our past. We put a nice little generic. This is youth of the mission. We've been around for 60 years. I think some of our timelines would really help that the people to understand that we didn't land mm -hmm. end up here today especially for parents to know that we've been around for so long. And also in that timeline to talk about some of the things that we've seen uh, amazing happen, but also some of the challenges we've had and grown through. Uh, I think when we talk about authenticity and integrity, we tend to put our morning, we don't, we tend not to put our morning face, but our noon face when we're in the middle of the day and we're all happy and everything's perfect. And I'm not saying we should put, you know, the, the good, the bad and the ugly, But I would just say, let's put the real journey. Let's let's share the dynamics and the challenges. Uh, also, I think in our language, we often tend to be very sacred driven. And, you know, and then we, we uh, how should I say, uh, we exclude those who don't think as spiritually as we do, because often our context is very spiritual. 
the word of the Lord. You know, I want to be missionary. And the term missionary is also still something I think that's evolving. I, I would I would at least want to dare put that out there uh, just because the times are changing. So there's a lot there. I, can, I don't think I can sum it up that much. There's so much, actually, that I'll probably need a seminar on this. Uh, but there is some homework to do. And I think the Holy Spirit can help us if we ask him to figure out, because we don't want to do quantum leaps. We want to do small steps to getting better because that's healthier than if we do, you know, suddenly radically change our language. I think we need to grow in our language. And I believe in us. I believe that if we ask God for help and wisdom, he will help us. And, you know, we can, there's some amazing YWAM communicators who are very gifted at this. Listen to them, help them help you. Uh, and if not, call me, I'll tell you <laughs> some things that, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would also say, just I just want to add to that, the other layer is we're trying to communicate in English to many cultures, right? So, for example, I'll make a website that's international. But remember that African English, Indian English, <laughs> Asian English, South American English, these people, if they come to the website and they speak English as a second language, often it's very, how should I say, uh, it's very professionally written nowadays sometimes that those people have to look up words and they have to get Google Translate to do it. And believe me, Google Translate doesn't do a good job because that's why people listen but don't understand. Um, so we need to contextualize better and simplify our language for our global audience, as well as we have the dynamic that we have parents looking at the websites, we have the youth looking at the website. And I have seen that although we have the multicultural dynamic, now we also have the multi-generational dynamic. So it's, I, I believe we have tension in the multicultural at times, but at times also in the multicultural, because then when a, a senior leader tries to say, communicate for me this, and a young communicator does this, we go, well, I wouldn't say it that way. Yeah, but if it's for young people, trust their language and believe that that will connect with young people. And so there's also sometimes this tension that happens as well. Sorry that I had to add that. I think that was important. Yes. Yeah. And um, maybe because um, taking advantage uh, to have you here and um, being an artist, like, um, and I, I was, I was curious because I know you, you teach also on visual communication, and uh, so maybe a, a different direction. Like, but um, when I was uh, in school, like uh, we were often talking about like. Um, um, art is relative, right? Uh, everyone like see what they want and beauty is relative, like there's no beauty, but um, it's always been a question of mine, like um, is, is there a universal um, beauty or how can I communicate something that everyone will be able to understand? Or um, I don't know, you're a graphic designer, uh, you design so do you have like, um, yeah, certain tips or thing how to create uh, visual visually in a way that it will talk to everyone around the world. Oh, you're asking a designer. <laughs> it's a hard <laughs> question for a designer to answer. Um, well, there, you know, we we've, we've been told beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? So, uh, question is: Is the beholder the person that's sending the information as beautiful, or the person receiving it as beautiful? And we've actually probably in this one, we clearly answer the question by, oh, if I think this is beautiful, then it must be beautiful. But there must be some some foundation to what is beauty. Well, in my context as a graphic designer, be beauty is when it adds life, when it nurtures, when it cultivates, when it reminds, when it moves you uh, to the better, not to. Uh, so it should have, I would think that beauty should include hope it should include love it should include sacrifice sacrifice is not negative it's when you know you're sacrificing for the sake of something greater than you so therefore i think anything that's that should be valued as beautiful should be nurturing it should be life-giving it should be um yeah it, it should give you a sense of belonging as well uh, because we are beautiful beings the world is beautiful and i think when we create and when we communicate why don't we uh, highlight that, those beauties? Why don't we reflect on those beauties and bring something 
much greater, much grander than what is. I mean, when a poet writes words, they're not just trying to use use the words for the sake of using them. They're trying to make sense of something, creating an image in our minds or giving us a context by which we elevate ourselves. So as long as it's elevating, I think it's good. As long as it gives it gives me a heartbeat that gives me the sense of uh, joy, then don't you think beauty should be that? At least as a designer, I love it when my clients uh, or anyone who I serve with any design, I like when their eyes start sparkling because you can tell for them this is beautiful. And for them, I know I've given it my best and with the help of the Holy Spirit to make sure they shine because beauty is about making sure the light is bright and it's clear and it's uh, to the point. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll keep it at that because there's more to it, but I think I would say elevation and uh, mm -hmm. adding value and bringing life. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I guess it, I related to, well, just communication using words, like, you know, like uh, I use images and colors, but like uh, just how, like through words, we, we generate life or we create life and like to choose the words that are going to elevate people um, in our communication. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I love how um, it can be related. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Years ago, I was designing a magazine in YWAM here that we haven't, we, we didn't, we stopped publishing eventually, but it was a thematic magazine. And I remember one of the topics we had was a cult. Uh, and the question was, what kind of cover do you put on a Christian magazine that's dealing with the occult? And so I took a picture that's a bit darker and I designed it in a way that showed the, the how should I say, on one side, the, how we can be captivated by the occult at the same time we forget that it's actually also imprisoning so i did a picture that looked captivating but yet imprisoning and i remember my editor said we can't do this we're a christian magazine i said well what do you want to put up front do you want to put something just uh, you know pretty and some guy looking out the window going i used to be in the occult and that's it uh, because you wanted to attract the audience that would recognize this is a topic that you need to be taught on and funny enough, those that magazine and another later, a uh, couple years later on New Age, were one of the best sellers because people that were walking by the Christian bookstores that saw these magazine covers walked in and said, I want to know more about this. And so, you know, even when it comes to topics that are harsh, you can create something enticing, beautiful, where you could invite a person into a conversation. Uh, and in visual arts, it's the same thing. You're not just creating for the sake of communicating visually, you're wanting to nurture or trigger a conversation that will hopefully uh, yeah. continue for a while. So, and uh, I, I was wondering, um, you say that you were working for YUM, obviously, but also for non-Christian clients mm -hmm. and that you were there to serve them, but also to disciple people in the same time. And uh, um, I would like you to develop a little bit on how you disciple non-Christian mm -hmm. people with the uh, principles of communications according to the kingdom of God. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of my favorite uh, themes is I take Bible verses and I put invisible ink on my art. I'm just kidding. No, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke. Uh, <laughs> okay. Just to, to, to loosen us up a little bit. Um, no, the, the way I think, I, I, I believe that when you serve an audience or your clients or the people that God has called you to serve, you serve them with passion, with excellence, and with an intention that you're here to champion them. It's like washing their feet. You're actually saying, I want you to be the center stage and the center point. So what I've seen is that when I've served my, when I've gone beyond, uh, because I've never thought of my work as, okay, they're paying me per hour or they're paying me for, for a project. I want them to be excited at the end of the project and feel like their communication problem was solved by my serv servitude or by my service. Uh, the way I do it is often I try to do a great work. My presentations are, I do them, I do them to the best of my capacity. And then again and again, I just see clients come back to me and say, I have worked with many graphic designers, but the way you did it is very different. Why? Yeah. And then I usually say, well, uh, what do you mean? Why? Like, what's, what are you asking? Well, 
you know, everybody would do this, but you did this. I'm like, well, because that's a value I have. And they go, so where did you study? And I say, well, I haven't really officially had any training, um, self-taught, but I did do a small course with, a, with an organization. And then eventually the conversation comes up to, so what? how come you're such an inspired person? Because whatever you've just done has inspired me. And then I drop the, the what I call the, uh, the, the, the fun part. Um, <laughs> I, I usually say, well, my boss uh, is very good at this. And so they go, who's your boss? I'm like, well, we call him Dr. G or I call him Dr. G. Like, where's Dr. Oh G God. from? Well, he's everywhere. And so then I come into this idea of having provoking my audience a little bit and my client in the context of making them hungry for or so not just right away saying oh i believe in jesus christ and you should believe in jesus christ and you better get saved otherwise you're going to hell you know uh, but rather because the work now has spoken for itself and now mm -hmm. i have the opportunity to actually journey with them and then they say well where's he from i'm like well he's all over the <laughs> he travels a lot and then they go well is he known i'm like oh yeah he wrote a bestseller and they're like, what is it called? I'm like, Google, best, you know, most most sold book, most translated book in the world. And you will see. So they often come back after a week and go, wait, 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 the Bible? Wait, you're a, you're a Christian? And then I go, well, what do you mean by Christian? Like, well, you're not religious. I'm like, yeah, I'm not. Uh, so what's you, so you believe in like a God, like, like God himself in it? I said, yeah. I said, if you open the book and read it, there's a lot of things in there that equip you to live life really well. I, and I tell him that that's really, my dad did this too. He said, Joseph, when you grow up, read the Bible from come to end. It's a book on philosophy. It's a book on life. And my dad was not even a believer at the time. Later, he did become a believer. Mm. But the book is full of stories of people who were inspired to do great things. And in my small you know, work field that I do, I want to do great things so that my clients can be inspired. And then through it, often I'll end up sharing about my faith and how that inspires me. And I believe that we all are inspired by something. In my case, it's the teachings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will mention why I went. Like, I remember one time I was working for Mercedes-Benz and I had a seminar with them. And uh, after showing them a couple of logos, I showed them the YM logo. And I mean, this is a true story. And they all looked at the logo and said, that's a cool logo. <laughs> and then they literally turned around to each other and said, why don't we have a logo like this? And I mean, this is like 2003, four. And, uh, and out of my mouth without thinking came this word like, well, you're not as cool as I am. <laughs> like, uh, these are my clients, you know, they're, they've invited me here to teach and I'm saying this. And then I kind of uh, went back a step and I said, okay, let me ask you this question. Uh, and this is a true story. I said, what do you guys do? And they said, well, we create cars. I said, okay, so what does a car do? A car takes a person from A to B. And in your case, with safety and style, right? This is Mercedes-Benz after all. <laughs> At the same time, I said, uh, in comparison, I said, let me ask you this question then. Would you work for Mercedes-Benz for free? Because you believe in the mess in the in the outcome of safe mm -hmm. and beautiful transportation. They said, no, they, they pass. It's a job. I said, but you engineer, you're engineers because you want to solve problems. And they said, yeah. I said, well, YWAM is a movement of young people that want to solve problems some major issues of our world today. Everything from poverty to uh, hope to justice uh, to understanding the purpose of life. And I said, we train young people to actually go out there and bring the message of love, of hope, of justice, and of who God is and God's love, that they are loved and they are of value to many people. And guess what? They do it by paying their way there. They, they believe so much in this that they actually put their own time and energy and resources into it. I said, so you tell me who's cooler. And they all agreed. <laughs> the table, and they said, I said, if you'd like to know more about why uh, let's talk at the break at lunch. And seriously, Laurence, uh, I mean, I had 12 engineers sitting around like, so can we join why <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can. But I said, you have to believe a certain way. You have to you know, this and that. And they're like, so you have to actually believe like you guys? I'm like, well, we're interdenominational. So if you're Catholic or Orthodox, but you have to be Christian, you have to believe in Jesus. And you need to know the book a little bit. So you should read the book of the of the author, you know, like the, the author of all life. And they were like, so wait, so you are a missionary? I'm like, yeah. Like, wait, so you came to Germany with YWAM? Yes, I came to do a course and then I stayed. And they're like, 
wow, you're the coolest missionary I've ever met. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you. But, you know, I said, uh, you know, and then they said, but I can't believe you're a Christian because you're so full of life. So, you know, da, 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 da. And I said, well, how can you be believing in the God of life and not be someone who projects mm -hmm. life? And yeah. so in many ways, I think the language that we have has become a bit broken for us because we try to communicate Christian needs to people. We really need to learn relevance of how to communicate in context of the people that God calls us to serve. So whether I'm, if I work with YWAM, of course I speak YWAMese, that's easy. But if I work in a, a business model, I talk in their business model and I try to pick up where they are, what they're passionate about, and then connect God to that passion. Because mm -hmm. I believe that all passion that men have is God inspired. Yeah. So you know, generally, at least if it's a good passion in solving the world or like helping people or doing something of value today. Mm. Sorry, that was a long answer to a short question, but no, that's <laughs> good. Sorry. But I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just thinking it's a shame that these engineers didn't came to Warium because with uh -huh. all of our cars that have breakdowns in Warium, you know, <laughs> that would have really, really helped. <laughs> well, then we would also need fundraisers because they'll all say at the end, you should get a Mercedes Benz, and then we have to fundraise for Mercedes Benz vans, and they're a bit more expensive. <laughs> but yeah, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> we need a lot of people in Warium. Uh, <laughs> for the Great Commission, we need a lot of things. So. Yeah. No, but I think it's really interesting. And uh, uh, personally, I'm uh, in a transition where I work with YM, but also I'm working with a company of um, professional dancers that are not Christian. And I feel sometimes stuck into my communication and how, because I was so used to speak uh, with a certain language within YM and being Christian with Christian people. And now I'm like more with like those non-Christian people and into an artistic um, area that is really different as well. And so like, I'm, I'm, like for me, it really speaks to me what you say, you know, like how we need to communicate according to the audience that we have. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I think there was, a, there was an episode I saw from Marit from Finland talking about how to make your audience, how to know your audience and communicate yeah. with them really well. Yeah, as yeah, I think I found it on the e, on the ELLC yeah. website, yeah. I believe. And so, um, also, there's a question that we used to uh, to speak to ask to uh, each speakers. It's about uh, mistakes that you uh, might have done, you know, in the past, and like I don't know if you could share one or two mistakes that you've done, like not to uh, like just. You know, because we all make mistakes and it's important to be able to relate to each other and I don't know, like lessons that you uh, you learned from these mistakes. Mm -hmm. Can you share something mm -hmm. with us? Well, that's a longer list than the successes, <laughs> I must say. So there's a lot to pull from there. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes even we make as communicators to believe or assume that because we are good with one audience, that we're good with another audience. Mm -hmm. and how many times I have found myself thinking, I'm assuming that I did a good job when people said, you confused me. <laughs> um, because we come to this reality uh, of this happening. Um, probably one of the largest uh, mistakes I think I have probably done is I assumed also again with uh, my staff that I uh, had at the time in my ministry uh, or in our ministry that what 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 they said i thought i heard but i hadn't and i realized very quickly that um i wasn't listening anymore i was filtering and i think just the reason why i shared that earlier is because i was so good at this at filtering myself usually you don't teach on things you don't know you teach on things you've experienced mm -hmm. so uh i remember one staff kept on coming back and saying hey we need to hang out and i said yeah yeah we will you know and i thought what he meant is relaxed hangout, but he needed to process a lot more. Mm. And I waited so long that eventually it exploded. And the, the when it exploded, it was really ugly, like literally like, you know, being bombarded with, you're the worst leader ever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, at least I learned one good thing. I thought, okay, now I got to listen properly. And instead of reacting, I said, okay, now that you've ranted for 15 minutes, do you want to go on some more? And actually, he went another, another while as well. And then I turned to the other stuff and I said, I seem like I haven't been listening. So this is your chance. Tell me truly what you believe. And 
I think I failed. Like I went home and I felt, how did I do this? How did I not manage to have heard before what all these people have been wanting to say to me? And I've fallen into isolation because one of the things also that can happen to not only communicators or leaders or staff or students, we can isolate ourselves into our inner world. And then we begin to be so busy with our own world and our own inner world that our filtering systems begin to kick in properly. And then we only hear what we need to hear because we're busy with ourselves and forgot to really be present. You see, mm -hmm. you can be physically present, but we're not mm -hmm. really present and connected. Yeah. So maybe even the word connected would be better. We need mm -hmm. to be in a place and connected, not be in a place present, but disconnected. Mm -hmm. And that that taught me a lot. And I started and I learned from that lesson and I started talking about maybe we should have honest hours in a team so that we have a moment where everybody can share where they're at and some need more time to share and you need to give them those times and I would be sometimes very impatient. You see, we all fall, or I, and I've done this, I'll fall in the trap that, well, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Well, at what point do you make that a expectation mm -hmm. uh, rather than say, okay, I can do it, but it doesn't mean everybody else can quickly share where they're at. I need to give them the time I need to build the trust mm -hmm. and so on. So yeah. I I had my own team scream at me, which I deserved. And I was very happy that happened. It taught me a lot of lessons. And uh, I know better now, but it's those lessons that we learn yeah. that teach us. The better. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I think this uh, this question of uh, like these filters that how we become uh, specialized in the uh, in, in like listening to what we want to listen to. Um, it's something that we need to be aware of, but uh, it's so difficult to grow into that, I think. Uh, That's true. Yeah, That's so. true. Mm -hmm. But listening takes, <laughs> listening, I, I, I was at the studio, it was an open day at the studio and uh, and God told me in the morning, no, I need to do you listen to people but i was so tired at the end of the day because <laughs> i to truly listen you know it's just like uh it it, yeah. it asks like energy to to really be present in the mm -hmm. moment to what people are saying yeah but it's so much i felt i felt um i felt um uh it was a very blessed moment of really encounter uh just because i was in this listening mode yeah a lot mm -hmm. more rich than just i mean we're so used with her a voice message you know talking to herself so yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah but thank you joseph i um i i wanted to ask you also like um if we um if we want to go deeper into like how to well communicate uh to how to better listen maybe how to be better communicator like um would you recommend like any books or podcasts or like uh people to people who inspire you who like um, you learn from? Well, if you can tap into the Holy Spirit, that would be the best. <laughs> um, it's hard because I don't think there's like specific books. I think a lot of my experience has taught me what I know about communication. But I mean, I always recommend Far Into Familiar for those people who want to learn more about the cross-cultural, which I think a lot of Wyomers know the book from Sarah Lanier. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any books that really gave me a lot about communication. There were a few, but I skimmed through them usually very quickly because now comes another weakness. I'm a very impatient man. I tend to <laughs> want to just get to the end and give me the give me the, the context quickly. I don't don't take me through 500 pages of books just to say you should learn to listen and here are five tips <laughs> of listening. Sit down, lean over and say I'm here, I'm listening. You know, you could do that in two pages. But that's me, you see, I have to realize that no, I'm not wired like everybody else and neither should i be and should neither should they be like me uh but i i usually just go searching and i look for what books are out there i could put a list together and send it on um, into the group on mm -hmm. facebook uh but i would have to go digging for it i didn't prepare any lists right now specifically or show because you, you know your books, books ready <laughs> well no because you see uh back in the day when we moved to hawaii we shipped all our books over and none of them like very few of them arrived oh no so we lost a lot of our books um so there's a lot and also remember that communication is not just okay here's a book on communication 
a book on relationships can teach you about communications, a book on art can teach you about communications, a book on mm -hmm. engineering and problem solving or worldview can help you understand communication dynamics mm -hmm. or culture. So mm -hmm. there's a lot there that you can draw from. I always say even scientific books have, I mean, I remember reading one time, seeing a documentary on uh, molecules and how proteins communicate in the body. And I went, oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So they send a message and they receive it. Okay, so that means feedback loops are not just a normal thing that we should be doing. It's actually all around nature, that nature does give feedback. And then there's acknowledgement and so on. So you learn a lot from everything. So I would say, open your eyes, open your ears, and dig deep and you'll be surprised how much we can learn. Mm. Open your eyes, open your ears. Yes. And your heart, of course. Yeah, and your heart. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. I think like when I hear you talking since the, we started together, uh, talking about communication, what, what I can hear and see behind what you're sharing, it's about love, it's about having values, sharing values, being connected, being uh, good listeners, uh, mm -hmm. taking time, uh, I, I, I took notes about all these words, you know, like it's kind of like lots of uh, keywords, you know, uh, like being intentional and uh, um, don't be in a rush, but go deeper into the meaning as well. So I think everything that you said is really um, relevant and encouraging for us. And I hope like many people will be able to come um, to go on YouTube and, and, and watch this interview later on and even like just brainstorm about it and and think how we can put that into practice. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anything anything thank you, you would like to add before we finish? Is there a specific well, motto or one book that definitely impacted me very many years ago was a book from a man called H.R. Ruckmacher called The Creative Gift. And mm -hmm. I think in there he use a very beautiful metaphor called love is a framework and within the framework of love which is what you mentioned Laurence as well that that's the basis of why we should communicate why we communicate and why we should communicate um, and he says within the framework of love there's creativity and freedom but God gave us the framework and the framework should be love not a framework so I mentioned this last week in when I was teaching in a school and they all said explain the framework and I said the framework is love and let's remember that God is love. God communicates because he loves. God wants us to communicate because he wants to reflect his love. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. Whether it's speaking the truth in love, whether it's challenging, discipling, even to the point of disciplining. God has always been very clear. I will discipline you because I love you. Mm -hmm. So love is the outcome of any good communication and should be the, uh, the source of why we communicate mm -hmm. as well, the initiative. Uh, what initiates mm. uh, communication as well. So that would be like my conclusion to just kind of frame our conversation together. Yeah. And thank you so much for letting me share my heart, my journey, and some of the tiny little wisdoms I have mm -hmm. gained over the years. Yeah. Thank you so much for spending this time together. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for, for this uh, interview and all these deep things that you shared with us. And I think mm -hmm. it's a very good conclusion that you uh, you did to end the interview. And uh, I want to uh, to say thank you for knowing me um, also yes. that uh, uh, helped me with the <laughs> My questions. pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, Joseph yeah. makes me laugh, gives me life. It's always a pleasure to yeah. to to be with him on Zoom and in person. And maybe um, because like uh, josephavakian.com, right? Because mm -hmm. there's like uh, all the information and more like uh, if you don't know Joseph Quirk or Joseph Teaching or if you're looking for an incredible yeah. teacher, on creativity like um yeah it's worth going just to, to just to read his bio is just worth going <laughs> yeah yeah okay goodbye everybody right. and uh have a have a Thanks. very good day bye 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 au revoir, au revoir. <laughs>